Sports Social Podcast Network. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to AI Scouted on Anfield Index Pro. I'm Dave Hendrick, joined as always by Mr. Carol Matchett. How are you, sir? Positively blooming, sir. How are you? I'm not as good as you, apparently. <laughs> you must have another holiday booked. No such thing, no such thing. We, we, we won't we won't hold our breath on that one. Uh, we are here today to discuss Liverpool's upcoming Premier League fixture against Brentford. That game will take place tomorrow at 12.30. Uh, we are doing a short turnaround on this one due to scheduling conflicts, but we're here anyway. Uh, Carl, Liverpool have gone to Brentford twice since Brentford were promoted and failed to win either time. Potential for the development of a bit of a bogey ground if we can't pick up a win tomorrow? Yeah. um, I've been to both these games. I'm I'm going tomorrow, so I'm hoping that this has absolutely nothing to do with me, despite what you and um, Guy continually try to suggest. But it has definitely been a a very difficult game for us. I think, you know, we've spoken multiple times about Ivan Tony, and, you know, the first time we came up against him, he really did give Joel Matip a handful. Um, Mm. In that in that first encounter, that was the three three. People remember it. It was a really good game. Excuse me, very backwards and forwards. Last year, I wouldn't say it really has too many correlations with anything, just because we were completely crap last year for very much most of the year. So, yes, it has been difficult for us, but also it's such a small sample size of matches. I don't think we can read too much into it at this stage. But like you say, if we don't get the business done tomorrow, then yeah, sure, we'll be looking at it and thinking, oh, why are we incapable of beating this team so regularly? Yeah, like you look back that first game, they played quite a direct aerial style. And Ivan Tony absolutely battered Joel Matip all over the place. Then last year, they didn't have Tony for that game. But they still played direct. It was just a different type of football. They played direct into the channels and used the pace of Mbomo and Visa to get in behind us and cause us significant problems. And they were sensational on set pieces in that game. And, you know, prior to that, I'd always thought of this Liverpool team as being very good defensively on a set piece. But in that game, they looked like a gang of lads that had never defended before. And, you know, it just, it was such a, it was such a, a stark contrast from what we were used to seeing under Jurgen Klopp in terms of defending the set piece to this Brentford team who came in with obviously three big centre-backs, you know, um, plus Norgard and Janot from midfield, five big, tall players. But the rest, you know, quite small. I mean, Rico Henry, Roarslev, Jensen was taking some of the set pieces in Bommel. These are not big commanding players. It was just, it was strange to see how how much we struggled with set pieces in that game. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it was kind of, all areas of defending we really struggled with because we couldn't really get any kind of press on them high upfield. We absolutely didn't win the physical battle in midfield. I, I wouldn't say that in either of those two games, in fact. And like you say, in actual defenders' terms, they really hammered us down the channels. They really hammered us with the runs behind from every bloody direction. We didn't do anything on set-piece defending. Like We were properly poor defensively as a whole team, not just a defensive unit, mm. but all over the park in that game. It was... Eye-opening in a little bit, but 
also there were some aspects of it which were you know repeat offenses let's say like the the runners from deep is something that we've a long long time struggled with and that was a a particularly effusive way of going about it by them but it's just that they had so many avenues to get into our final third that day and it just didn't seem like we could have really any way of coping yeah and it's an odd Liverpool team that played that day obviously Allison started in goal we had Trent with Ibu we had Virgil but Costa started Andy Robertson did not on the day he came off the bench and uh, the midfield was Harvey Fabinho and Thiago um Naby Keita and Curtis Jones came off the bench up front, though, we had Mo, we had Darwin, and we had Ox playing left wing, which was just a really odd thing that didn't work at all. Even though it was him that got the goal, Ox left wing was not an experiment that worked. Um, and, you know, you look back at the game the year before, we were much closer to full strength uh, in the 3 3. But again, we had, we just had issues with them. We didn't seem up for the physicality and the power of that Brentford team, which the previous year was was a bigger, tougher team because they had Tony. They also had Onyeka in midfield instead of Jensen, so bigger, more powerful, a bit quicker, not as technically gifted. But, you know, we, we kind of expected it the first year because we'd seen a few games of them after the promotion. We'd seen how direct they could be. But last year really caught me off guard because – Without Tony, you were thinking, okay, well, they don't really have a presence up front. And they just exploited the fact that we were sending our fullbacks so high up the pitch. They dragged Ibu and Virgil all over the place. And both of them had absolute shockers in the first half. Um, Virgil obviously had to go off at half time. Ibu got the own goal. Ibu was also at fault for one of the latter goals, the Mbomo one. Not a good day's work for anybody involved. Yes, I would like to think that there will be um, uh, an overall team improvement, um, but certainly individual players compared to that game last season. There's no reason to suspect that there'll be any kind of repeat just because it happened at that ground or anything like that. But one or two of the players you just mentioned maybe have had their own off days of late. Yeah, yeah, and the hope will be that, you know, for, from from our point of view, that the couple in our team who've been a little bit off the boil will bounce back. But obviously, they're struggling this season. Um, having come into the division in the 21-22 season and finished 13th, where they started poorly, then they kind of, once they settled in, they started quite well, then they had a poor run, really poor run. Then they settled in and they just managed to grind down enough points to stay in. Last year, though, they thrived and they finished on 59 points in ninth position, which was a really, really good return for them. But this year, 25 points from 23 games, 14th in the league, seven wins, four draws, 12 defeats, only scored the 34 goals. Defensively, I mean, 39 isn't great, but it's pretty solid for a bottom half team. They obviously did have Ivan Tony suspended for the first half of the season, but it's not just him that's been absent. No Rico Henry from early on. Aaron Hickey's been injured quite a bit. Jensen's missed some games. At the moment, Mbomo's out. Um, they had a couple of lads at AFCON. Kevin Shade's been out for months. It's been a tough slog for them this year. And, you know, a lot of people talk about second season syndrome for Premier League clubs where they kind of get found out a little bit. It's very much been a a third season syndrome for Brentford, who they just really haven't had the same go about them that we'd seen in previous years. Yeah, I think that's fair. I do think that, you know, the the summer, obviously Tony is a big factor, but some of the work they did or probably more accurately didn't do uh, in the summer, I think was probably something that has led to a really slow start for them. Um, I also think that there was a couple of squad players that they didn't really replace. Like even you think back to the first season, uh, someone like Sergi Ganos played like quite a big role for them. 
but as a wing back and he was like pretty decent at the start after then he got injured they never really replaced that kind of people and we've spoken before about a few of the signings they've made have not really had the impact and not even not just like end product impact but i mean like not really contributed minutes wise to to the amount that they would have really hoped for this season like even i think like neil morpe has played like more minutes than uh, Lewis Potter has this season. Yamal yeah, obviously still very much a fringe player. Damsgaard is a nothing player. Shad is nothing at all. For, so it's it's been a few misses, swings and misses in the transfer market. And I do think for a club of that size, mm-hmm. while we've seen what can happen when you get it right, like Brighton, for example, we have also seen many, many more examples of what happens when you get it wrong. And it's quite an amount of money that they've spent, which so far they're not getting anywhere near enough return from. Yeah, I mean, in January, they were linked heavily with Antonio Nusa, the, the winger, um, the Norwegian winger. And, I mean, he's he's obviously a very talented player. And they were in talks with Bruges for most of the window and couldn't get that deal across the line. Now, it may still be that they bring that deal back in the summer, but... The reason that they were so keen on Noosa is because Keen Lewis Potter has not so far worked out for them. And Kevin Shade thus far has not worked out for them. If you look at the signings since they came up, Carl, um, Onyeka, 8 million. I mean, he's a decent squad player, but that's not great. Um, Christopher Ager has been good, but he's been injured a lot. So he hasn't played a huge amount. Johan Visa, I think, has worked out well. I think they've gotten good return on the eight and a half million that they paid for him. Um, then you look at Aaron Hickey. He's been good, but again, he's had some injuries. Like you said, Damsgaard hasn't delivered for them. Lewis Potter hasn't delivered for them. Shade hasn't delivered for them. That's probably 16, 17. It's probably the better part of 55 million on three players there that just haven't really delivered. And then this season, Flecken, he's been okay. He hasn't been great. Nathan Collins has been okay. He hasn't been great. And they've made this deal now for Igor Thiago, uh, Igor Thiago from Club Bruges, teammate of Antonio Nusa. Uh, He'll arrive in the summer. And I believe they've agreed to pay over thirty million for him. Like we talk about them as a well-run club, and they clearly are. But if you were to look at the Brentford team and start naming their best eleven, like when everybody's fit, Rico Henry was there when they came up. Norgard was there when they came up. Jensen was there when they came up. They got Ben Me on a free. Janelt was there when they came up. Tony was there when they came up. And Bomo was there when they came up. You're only really looking at Aaron Hickey. You could say Ager and Collins, but Ethan Pinnock has probably been every bit as good as them. A lot of the signings haven't worked out. They're really heavily reliant on the core of the championship team. And at a certain point, that championship team is going to run out of steam, is going to need upgrading and they haven't been able to do it so far yeah that's the worry is that it's not really a regenerated team um and apart from the fact of you know like you say running out of steam the the quality not consistently getting any better you've also got the fact that one or two of them obviously are approaching not too old status just yet but you know getting that way you have to eventually add to them they're also being relied on to play almost all the time because those other ones like we say who are being brought in are not really contributing even minutes wise so it's still the same there then you've obviously got the fact that along the way one or two of them will get signed by other teams whether it's because they've been really good or because the contract runs out or whatever it is there'd just be that natural departure somewhere along the way and other teams around them improving. You know, it just gets a little bit stale sometimes if the same team and the same manager playing the same way all the time. I think they benefited hugely from obviously the new stadium when they came up. Um, Mm -hmm. It was absolutely bouncing. And like, that's probably still a thing. I'll tell you tomorrow. Um, But 
it was something that definitely gave them additional, maybe not points outright, but certainly the energy to try and win the points. And, you know, if, if the home form is not great over a prolonged period of time, doesn't matter which fan base it is, you know, Crystal Palace we know have been really good for, for being a home support, but go and listen to a game there now. It's nothing like that. It's absolutely nothing like the levels of support you would have got previously. And the Brentford have won four games at home this season. And a couple of them have been in like the last four matches, I think, or five matches at home. So before that, it was not a good campaign for them on home soil at all. They're definitely uh, a little bit better um, in terms of going forward and attacking at home rather than away from home. But mm. overall, you know, there's a lot of goals being conceded. They've had a couple of particularly poor results. Some narrow defeats, like at, like the Arsenal game, for example, but losing 4-1 at home to, Brem- uh, to, to Wolves, sorry, is... yeah. Not really one that's going to be looked at and said, oh, it's just one of those days. You know, those are the kinds of games where they would expect at this point to be get and wins. Yeah. So if we look at their season, they drew with Spurs on the opening day. Um, they went one down, went two one up, ended up with a draw. Decent result. Then they went to Fulham and they walloped them. Then a draw with Palace, which in hindsight doesn't look great. A draw with Bournemouth, which in hindsight looks better than it did at that time. Lost away to Newcastle, that's fine. Then lost at home to Everton in a really poor performance. Um, Drew with Forrest. Forrest to the man sent off. Brentford went one up and then Forrest came back. That's disappointing. Lost away to United, having led from the 26th minute. Conceded two stoppage time goals to McTominay. Not a bad result, but you'll have been, they'll have been crushed coming away. Then they beat Burnley, beat Chelsea away and beat West Ham in a really good run. Went to Anfield and lost, played Arsenal and lost to a late goal when they'd missed a bunch of sitters themselves. Then they beat Luton. I mean, it's it's Luton, so we're not going to get too excited. But then they lost, lost five in a row and seven of eight. Away to Brighton, fair enough. Away to Sheffield United, not good. Home to Villa, fair enough. Hammered, and I mean hammered by Wolves. That could have been six or seven. Then they lost 3-1 away to a Crystal Palace team that just doesn't score any goals, having been one up. Um, beat Forest at home. Had a little bit of fortune in that one, but beat Forest at home. Lost away to Spurs, that's fair enough. Lost away to City. I lost at home to City. That's fair enough. I mean, you know, they went one up. Phil Foden got a hat-trick. It is what it is. Good win last time out, though, against Wolves. Having been hammered by them five or six weeks beforehand to go to Molyneux, where Wolves have been pretty good this year, and get a 2-0 win, that's promising for them. But this season, they've just been very, very inconsistent. And... Any time you lose, well, they, they lost nine of 11. Like nine of 11 is, is a dreadful run of form. And Thomas Frank can probably thank, count himself a little bit fortunate that there wasn't more attention on that, that there wasn't a bit more pressure on him. He's obviously got quite a bit of credit in the bank there, having been there quite a while, having brought them up. But losing nine of 11 in the Premier League is... Well, that that's called for, that's calls for for dismissal at, at, at a lot of clubs. Sports Social Podcast Network. Are you that person who has everything, the coolest merch, and those must-have fan threads? Well, over at our Anfield Index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection. From our popular range of bespoke design T-shirts, sweaters, hoodies, and hats, to our signature edition mugs prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to anfieldindex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. Yeah, I think what you've just said there, credit in the bank is probably the thing. Um, I like to think, I don't know whether it's really the case because, you know, we know some clubs are pretty badly run. 
and influenced by external factors. But I like to think that the lack of attention on him played no part in that. I like to think that the clubs themselves already know what the targets are, already know, have like really consistent analysis game to game and don't make decisions game to game. Don't make decisions based on, oh, he's facing more pressure this week and blah, blah, blah. They just know themselves what they're looking for. And I would like to think that either they saw enough in there to think that he can turn it around again afterwards, Mm. or like you said, credit in the bank. And that's what counts. And yet we still think that you're the one for us. And we still think that you have the ability to have the squad behind you and so on. And it has turned a, a little bit of late, not, not huge amounts, but given the the state of the bottom of the league, which we've spoken about before, yeah. had it been a different season, maybe that's a different question. But maybe there's also enough there at the minute to think, well, we'll still be comfortable enough this year and we have a summer to regroup. Yeah, I mean, there's five terrible teams in the league, Forest, Luton, Everton, Burnley and Sheffield United. And as long as you can keep your head above water and keep a, a decent enough gap between them, and right now there's four points between Brentford and Forest. You know you're going to be you're going to be okay. You've also got Crystal Palace, who are in a very weird situation at the moment, um, with injuries and with the Hodgson thing. Uh, so you know they're below them as well. So they 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 they'll be fine. And like you said, there's no reason for them to panic as a as a well run club. They'll they'll be a lot more clinical with their their decision making. Um. On Thomas Frank, he has been mentioned in connection to the Liverpool job, Carl. For me, I I just don't see him as somebody that... I mean, he's worth worth consideration, but I think it would be passing consideration. I don't think he's someone that you'd be really putting on your shortlist. That's just me. No, I agree. He he would be on the long list, not the short list. That's, yeah, that's yeah. where I would put him. Um, I think he's a really good coach. I I think why I would immediately be thinking no, though, is because my my feeling is that managers who get a bigger job after only having been at smaller jobs previously is that they sometimes can take a little bit too long to realise how good some of the players are at their disposal. And especially mm. when they have a really set way of playing. So this is only my own musings, obviously. This is nothing backed up by any data or nothing like that. Like, But if I think of someone like Roberto Zerbi against someone like Thomas Frank, right? the reason that I would be more inclined to consider De Zerbi as a coach than Thomas Frank, even though they're both coming from smaller clubs and they've both never had a really big job before. I mean, Deserbi was at Shakhtar, which is, has its own kinds of pressures, obviously, with title fighting and the rest of it. But in terms of the European elite and in terms of the level of individual players, they're roughly around the same sorts of level. The reason I would be more inclined about Deserbi is, one, because he was an outrageously good player. Like, he was never among the elite because he was you know, not the kind which was of that era, but he was a very, very good player. So I think he's more likely to be able to understand how good good players are if that makes sense but also because of his style of play which is much more open and open to changing formation according to who he's got available to him that's i think the biggest thing it's not so much a you know changing away from a 4231 to a 433 or a 44 or whatever it's much more about the positions that the players take up that's what i'm talking about how he lets them play how he lets them um combine in certain areas how he tries to um, allow certain players to have more freedom on the ball. That is, to me, the type of manager who would be able to implement a similar way of playing, but with an acceptance that better players are going to be able to do things better than he initially thought and adapt to that really, really quickly. Whereas I think someone like Thomas Frank, my view of him is that while he would be a good coach, he wouldn't be immediately able to impart uh, an openness to the team, which lets the very, very good players be as good as they are. It Mm. would be a little bit more within a structure. It would be a little bit more to play a specific way. Yeah, I mean, cautious is obviously part of it with some managers. I don't necessarily think that's all the way of what I'm thinking of with Frank. It's much more about playing within a framework and not going outside that enough to make the best players 
show or, or display their very best traits. And sometimes I think it's really difficult for managers to either understand that quickly enough or have the ego to, uh, to open themselves up to being a little bit more expansive or a little bit more attack minded or, or whatever it is in their individual case. I just don't quite get the sense from Thomas Frank that would be quick enough of an upgrade for him. Yeah, I think that's very fair. I mean, I, I think he's a very, very good man manager. I think he definitely gets great buy-in from his players. But like you, I, I do sort of wonder if he'd if he'd realise just how good the players at Liverpool were and whether he would be willing to change his style and his fundamental principles to adapt to the better players he now has at his he now have at his disposal as opposed to what he's used to working with. Because we've seen like David Moyes is the prime example of this. David Moyes did a really good job at Everton for a long time, uh, proving that you don't need trophies to be a winner, but he is a winner. But he went to Manchester United and he tried to make Manchester United play like Everton. And he was showing Nemanja Vidic and Rio Ferdinand videos of Phil Jagielka and telling them, this is how I want you to defend, rather than adjusting for the better calibre of players. He had the higher calibre of players. I would have some concerns. Like, is Thomas Frank walking in and, and saying to Virgil, look, here's an hour of Ethan Pinnock. I want you to go and study this, because that's probably not going to play all that well. Um the other thing I wanted to talk to you about with Brighton is the Ivan Tony situation, Carl. So <clears throat> obviously he's out of contract in 2025. There had been there's been some reporting that there's you know there was talks around the potential for an extension, but Thomas Frank has said a number of times this season that he expects Ivan Tony to leave at the end of the season. He made it very clear they didn't want to sell him in January, that it would take a huge amount of money to sell him in January, but that come the end of the season, they'd you know, come to a, a, an acceptance that Tony would move on. Ivan Tony came out after the Wolves game with some really bizarre comments about how he was interpreting that as Thomas Frank not wanting him at the club anymore. What did you make of this situation with with Tony and the comments he made? Um, I don't know how much I read into Ivan Tony's uh, um, comments, to be honest. I, I don't know if this is just like a post-match thing or... I don't know. It was quite a few years ago. He actually was very close to a move to Wolves, so whether it's just, again, coincidental because of that game or whatever, I don't know. I think that Thomas Frank's words were um, more protecting Brentford than anything else. I don't really think they had any kind of consideration for Tony other than a message that if he doesn't sign, he has to be sold. I think it was much more a message of protection for, for the club, like I said, like saying that it's obvious he'll be sold and that there'll be interest is almost a admission that business is there to be done, but you're still going to have to pay money for them. Um, and telling clubs who have that sort of long-standing reported interest that you know they'll they'll have to make a move fairly early because they expect a lot to be there. That was what I read into Thomas Frank's. Yeah, I think you I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Thomas Frank is protecting Brentford, which is Thomas Frank's job. I mean, Thomas Frank is is employed by Brentford. He is the the face and the voice of Brentford. And he is the one who does their bidding, and rightly so. And, you know, the only thing that matters to him is the health of the football club. If I was Ivan Tony, like I've said this before, I'd be thanking Thomas Frank every single day for how well protected Ivan Tony was while he was suspended, because on multiple occasions... Thomas Frank went to bat for him. And on multiple occasions, he was asked questions about Ivan Tony, and he steered the conversation away in a very diplomatic manner. Because, look, Ivan Tony let Brentford down. One way or another, he let them down. He got himself an extended ban, missed over half a season. 
And like, let's not pretend this is the first time he's blotted his copybook there. There's at least one, possibly two videos of him saying very unkind things about Brentford Football Club that other clubs <clears throat> certainly, you know, publicly would have uh, rebuked him. They've never said a word to him publicly. There's never been a cross word publicly from the club to Tony, either, either over comments made or that that ban that he got himself. So, like, Brentford have done their part to protect Ivan Tony. I kind of feel like Ivan Tony owes them a bit more than what he's giving them. As in, he, you think he should stay beyond the end of no, the season? No, I don't think he should stay. I'm not, I'm not talking about committing his future. I think when he's asked about, you know, Thomas Frank has said this, it should be an automatic, we'll talk about that in the summer. Right now, I'm going to give 100% commitment to this club that have stood by me when a lot of other clubs right. wouldn't. A lot of other clubs I mean, would have binned him off. Agreed. But to be fair, like, I know that, like, the, the, the words which will have been reported, like, but when he said, um, like, I see that as the manager doesn't want me, he's laughing at that point. Like, he knows it's not, like, a, a real thing. And he did say, I'm not sure if it's in the same interview or afterwards, he says, I can't make clubs bid for me, basically. And he's just got to carry on scoring goals and doing what I do. And what will be, will be. I don't think he's really angling for a move certainly not as much as he has done before where he's you know been really open about playing for like Champions League clubs and mm. you know wanting to be uh, uh, in the England squad on a regular basis that kind of thing and he said that might mean I have to leave Brentford he's, he's definitely done that a few times but I didn't see like I said I, I don't really see anything that he said after the Wolves one as a a downer on the club or anything like that not not this time I must admit that's fair that's fair if I was Tottenham I think I'd be I'd be getting in the Ivan Tony business this summer, to be totally honest. I think that's the the big missing piece for them is that that number nine that can bring others into the game. I if you, you could find a way to make Rich Allison have a really good last like two months of the season so that a uh, a Bayern or maybe even Barcelona find some, you know, spare change under their twenty six thousand sofas or, you or know, PSG some way to get, needing yeah, some needing way an Mbappe replacement. Some, yeah, like anything that you can get of some of your money back, like 60, 70% of your Richarlison money back, and then lash that on Tony, I think you've, mm. you've won there. Yeah, 100%, 100%. I still really want Aston Villa to buy Ivan Tony because I just think Ivan Tony and Ollie Watkins as a front two would be absolutely horrible to play against. And I think they'd me- they'd mesh fairly well together. But let's move on. Uh, this weekend, they have some injury issues. We do as well, but ours, not as bad as they, they were a couple of weeks ago. They are missing Rico Henry, Brian and Bomo, Aaron Hickey, Kevin Shade, and Josh De Silva. And Johan Wiesa and Frank Onyeka are doubts because they're just back from AFCON. So if we look at their squad, we're probably, well, Mark Flecken will be the goalkeeper, obviously. Um, Regulon at left back, they brought him in on loan. I, I think that's a pretty smart move. I assume Roarslev plays right wing back with his immense lack of technical ability. Uh, ben Mee, Nathan Collins and Pinnock. As a back three, I assume. Then in midfield, Jensen, Norgard, and Janelt. And up front, I'm guessing Tony and Johan Visa. I, I assume that's kind of what we're looking at. Oh, actually, it could well be Neil Mope, given Visa's just back. And Mope is, is actually playing surprisingly well. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> This is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. 
My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. I mean, he's in the goal-scoring form of his career if you look at the last three, four years, that's for sure. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a mad thing that, you know, he was obviously at Brentford in, in the championship, had an outrageous season, scored 28 goals in 49 games in all competitions, went to um, to Brighton, spent three years there, scored 27 goals in 109 games in all competitions, and then joined the Ev, and because the like even at Bre- Brighton, he was still getting like eight, nine, ten goals a year. Joins Everton, one goal in thirty-two games. Goes back to Brentford, he has seven in nineteen. It it's absolute madness. This is he, he's yeah, like you said, he's having the best season that he's had since before he left Brentford the first time round. And that was in the championship. So massive credit to him. Um, he's horrible to play against. Nobody seems to enjoy, no opponent seems to enjoy their afternoon or evening spent in the company of Neil Mopay. But his teammates do seem to think very highly of him. And he's obviously very popular there at Brentford. Yeah, I mean, like if you've got a player who is a pain in the ass for the opposition and works hard for you, of course you like him as your teammate. That's that's what it's always been. Whether they have the technical level of Paul Dickov or the technical level of Luis Suarez, if they behave in that way and they defend their team in that way, of course you like them on your side. That's Just to confirm there, Paul Dickov is the high end and Luis Suarez, <laughs> yeah, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, so actually Mope, Mope almost certain to start uh, next to Ivan Tony up front, you would guess. Which, look, this brings its own <coughs> issues for Liverpool second half, you know, uh, in terms of very quick options off the bench for Brentford. Yeah, the possibility if if Lisa's fit, which I, he is fit, it's just about whether or not he's ready and able to play. Um, having him plus Keen Lewis Potter, who Look, it hasn't really worked out for him since joining, but he's still still a young player, only 22. And he does have a couple of goals this season, but he can be a good outlet for them. So having the two of them as options off the bench against potentially a tired Liverpool team, that's less than ideal. Yeah, not, um, not, not superb. I mean... I, I do tend to still think that like so much of every single game depends on how Liverpool play and how quickly Liverpool start in particular. Like few teams can live with us when we're playing like we did against Chelsea, but most teams will beat us if we play like we did against Arsenal. It's yeah. It sounds really simplistic, but with this Liverpool team and the way that we play and the fact that when we don't play well, we still play in the same manner that's kind of how it goes. Like we either make it really difficult for teams or way too easy for them. It's hard to think of a team that's capable of those two performances. Like the performance against Chelsea was outrageously good. And we've had that performance a couple of times this season. Uh, Newcastle, Uh, West Ham, you know, we've had that performance a couple of times. But we've also had that Arsenal performance a couple of times. Now, we've gotten lucky in the other games where we've been able to manufacture a goal, manufacture a win, but we've played really poorly. 
you just you don't often see teams now we are a team in the middle or well in the early stages of a rebuild so it is understandable that there'll be some inconsistencies it's just rare that you see such a broad spectrum of performance possibilities from one team which do you think we're getting this weekend I really hope it's the performance like the Chelsea game. I really do. Um, We need to win this game because Arsenal take on Burnley and while we do have a two-point advantage on them and a slightly better goal difference, it is only a plus one goal difference. So if we were to draw here and they were to win by two clear goals they would go above us. And then City host Chelsea, which you'd expect them to win. And they've got that game in hand. And you don't want them having their game in hand while already being above you in the table. That's worst case scenario. Um, We need to put the pressure back on the other two by winning this game. We have... I think it's an advantage to play first on a weekend like this. I know people say, oh, 12.30 kickoffs. 12.30 kickoffs are fine unless they're after an international break. There's no excuse to be made for just a normal 12.30 kickoff. There just isn't. After the international break, yes, an away game at 12.30 is horrible because players are coming back. They're getting, you know, they're getting assessed. They only get maybe one training session in. But, these lads have had most of the week. Mm-hmm. Now, speaking of that, Jurgen said in his press conference today, let me pull this up. Um, Ibu is not suspended anymore. Joey is back. Connor is back. Ali is back. So that's all no, that's all positive. Thiago, no, and Trent not available. That's true. So Jurgen has said that Ibu obviously available. Joe Gomez, Connor Bradley, and Alison Becker are all back. Mo Salah has also been seen in training, in full training. So potentially he's back. Uh, Zabozla is is likely to miss out. But there is a rumor, and it is just a rumor, and that's all it is for now on Twitter that Alison has picked up a little hamstring injury in training. So. Who knows? Who knows? Um, fingers crossed Ali's fine, but Queeving played well against Burnley, so I wouldn't really have too many concerns if Queeving has to come in for this one, if I'm being completely honest. Yeah, absolutely. Not. I mean, it's only really this game which would be, you know, any kind of big difference. Like Luton at home shouldn't matter who's in goal. Queeving would be in goal for the League Cup final anyway so and he'll be in goal for the Southampton game yeah so well yeah quite possibly so you know worst case scenario yeah Alisson's injured but actually is it a worst case scenario because you give your other goalkeeper an opportunity to get a little bit more rhythm before he'll actually be required to play in a cup final so Mm. I'm not asked about that unless it's a hamstring tear requiring surgery in three months out for Alisson that might be something to cast a poll over the weekend but otherwise I wouldn't worry. I won't waste too much time worrying about it. You know, it's a it's a league game. We have a squad that's kind of what you expect somewhere along the way mm. with Allison by now, anyway. So don't worry about it too much. Just on the early kickoffs before we move on, um, we haven't lost any of the early kickoffs this season, and we've again played more than any other team. So it, it's not any excuse, and it's not any issue this time around in particular because it's. Even Klopp only really has an issue, like you said, after a midweek match when it's a, a Wednesday night match and then you turn around and it's only two full days and then you're, you're back in again for an early kickoff. So there is no excuse for underperformance, lack of energy, blah, blah, blah. Nothing of that counts. No, exactly. Right. We've got a question mark in defence then. Uh, Ibu surely comes back in next to Virgil. Yeah. But who starts in the fullback spots, Carl? I would go with um, Andy Robinson left and Joe Gomez right. Yeah, that's what I'd go with as well. A lot of people are clamoring for Connor Bradley, and mm. it's understandable. I mean, he the, the kid played really, really well. Um, but 
Joe Gomez has to start. Has to. He he absolutely the performance level he's put in this year demands that he start. So it really does come down to Robbo or Connor Bradley. Hmm. And look, at the end of the day, Jurgen is going to go with the guy that he feels he trusts implicitly, and that's Andy Robertson. He is, now, but I'll be honest, it also makes sense in terms of maybe match situations. It makes sense in terms of the possible substitutions that we've just mentioned from their side later on. We need someone quicker to come on. It makes sense in terms of um, the the replication of what, what we would be playing anyway, because Gomez has been not obviously Trent worthy in terms of creativity and that, but he's moved centrally perfectly fine. Mm. Like it's, it's been okay. So if we're going to have still this sort of uh, asymmetric fullback pattern, then it's got to be Gomez one side anyway. Um, and Robertson's obviously going to win the head to head on the other two. And also, yes, Connor Bradley played really well, but he's still a very, very young kid who let's not, overlook the fact that this will be his first fixture back, his first, you know, working day in the public eye back after what is one of the most terrible things that obviously anybody can go through, really. So I I don't think I would be rushing to just throw him back in the spotlight, throw him back into the, you know, into what is for Liverpool's perspective, obviously quite an important fixture. Maybe he's ready to come off the bench. Maybe he's ready to play, but maybe he's not. You know, Klopp will have to judge that on the day as much as, planning what his lineup will be beforehand. If it gets to mm. like two hours before kickoff and they're at the stadium and that, and he can see that Bradley's just not in the headspace, we might have to change it anyway. So I, I just, I'd be very, very wary of putting much expectation at the minute on him just from a, you know, being a human point of view as much as anything else. Yeah. Yeah, no, I fully agree with that. Um, and look, like, let's not forget, this lad was playing in League One last season. So, yeah, he's come in. He's done really, really well in a short span of time. There's no guarantee that he's going to replicate that level of performance game after game after game. And we do have to be cautious with him and make sure that we bring him along at the correct pace and don't just recklessly throw him into situations that maybe aren't as beneficial for him. Um Right, so Gomez, Ibu, Virgil, Robbo agreed on that. Midfield, I think it has to pick itself, really. Curtis, Endo, and Alexis. Yes. And then up front, Darwin. Also picks itself. <laughs> Darwin through the middle, Jota left, Salah right, or are you bringing Salah off the bench in this one? I'm absolutely not starting Mo Salah in this one, though. No. No chance. So Jota right side and Diaz left side? Yeah. Yeah. No consideration here for maybe a Cody Gakbo left wing opportunity? I'm just going to assume you can fill in the blanks there. <laughs> uh no, I think I'd be I think I'd be in full agreement there. I'd actually I think I'd actually play Diaz right and Jota left, but I don't think Jurgen will do that. Um, yeah, the team basically will pick itself, won't it? Even with the the couple of injuries, um, it will basically pick itself. So that's that's a positive thing for Jurgen. And obviously, we've this game. Then we play Wednesday night home against Luton, and then on the twenty fifth we have the EFL Cup final, followed by Southampton in the FA Cup. So. It's a busy couple of games, a couple of weeks coming up here, uh, up until the Forest game on the second of of March. That's it's it's a favourable enough run. It's games we should be winning. It's points we should be taking in the league. A trophy we should be picking up, and the advancement in another trophy. Um, and then it's all eyes on on that City game, because that really is the kind of. The, the big one. It could be it could be season defining in terms of the league. But we can't worry about that for now. We've just got to worry about getting the three points here. So Carol Matchett, what is your prediction? I'm gonna go two one for Liverpool. I think this is just gonna be a game where you just have to find a way. I don't actually think we might be the better team in this game, but I'm hoping that we have enough shots and firepower as such to just find a way. 
I think I went 3-2 on two-footed today. So I think I'll stick with that. Uh, 3-2. They're just, for whatever reason, they're just horrible for us to play against uh, when we go to their place. But I'm going to back us to win. I think we've got enough about us. Right, Mr. Matchett, is there anything you want to plug before we go? No, uh, if anybody hasn't listened, myself and Guy did uh, another pod during the week where we discussed various matters, including a smattering of laughter at Everton. So give that a listen. Uh, And obviously we'll be back with multiple speaking hours next week. There we go. Right, folks, take care of yourselves. Enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.